Assalamu alaikum. How are you doing, guys? Uh, today we're going to continue in part two of the series, uh, which is design of reinforced concrete structures as far as uh, flexure goes. Uh, in this uh, series, my uh, goal is to give you an introduction to the ultimate strength method, um, how it started, how it came about. Uh, we're going to introduce you to some um, load factors uh, according to the ACI code, uh, some reduction factors. Uh, maybe derive the first uh, equation for the calculation of the nominal moment and then have an example uh, on that. So with that, before I start the introduction, I would just like to remind you of the types of load that the structure might uh, uh, face, uh, which you probably took back in uh, structure one. Uh, some of these loads are, or the load types are uh, the dead loads. And again, those dead loads are uh, constant in uh, magnitude and fixed in location throughout the lifetime of the structures, which means they are fixed loads. They do not move. They do not change in intensity. Such an example would be the own weight of uh, the beam, column, or slab. Uh, the second type would be life loads, and those loads uh, change in both magnitude and location during the lifetime of the structures. So you might have a constant location, but a variable load. Uh, impulse load, for instance, you might have a, a constant load, but changing with location, such as a train or a bridge. Uh, pedestrians on a bridge uh, <clears throat> and again the magnitude and the distribution at any given time is uncertain uh, and that's why we call it uh, live load. Uh, the third type would be the environmental loads and these are mainly the snow, wind, pressure, and, uh, wind pressure and suction, the earthquake load, soil pressure on sur subsurface portion of structures and the temperature temperature differential. So all that we call environmental loads and we will show you in the, uh, when we apply the factors to these loads how they are uh, handled. So with that we're going to start with the ultimate design method and uh, the design basis for that is uh, to serve its purpose the structure must be safe against collapse, uh, deflection is adequately small, and cracks kept at a tolerable uh, limits, which means, I mean, you, you cannot really eliminate uh, the, the deflection, but you can try and keep it as small as uh, possible. And I'm talking about reinforced concrete structures here, not any other type of structures. Uh, cracks, they are always, they will be always there. But again, my goal is to keep them at a minimum uh, level. Now. Let's talk about the, the, the basic idea of the ultimate strength method. So if I look at this figure right here, and I have a, what I call a load uh, distribution. And why do I call it a load distribution? Because the maximum load that usually will occur during the life of a structure uh, has a degree of uncertainty. Uh, it can be assumed, or we could assume it is a random variable uh, with a probability model. Right? And that prob probability model has what we call a density function. And this is what I'm representing right here. Now, this is usually uh, unknown, uh, but uh, we can get it from a statistical survey. And if this data is not available, then we have to use uh, our experience and engineering uh, judgment. Now, Again, with any probability distribution, I'm going to have a, a mean value or average value. Okay, so it, it will be my goal to use a, a design value, which is this value, which will have a very small probability uh, of failure. Okay, and I will term this as QD or design load. Now, the same thing can be said of the strength. I can also assume that the strength is, well, I know it's a random variable, okay, because the structure depend on, uh, the structure strength, excuse me, depend on the material from which it was made, right? And the actual material strength usually is not known precisely. I have an idea, but I don't know what 
precisely it is, uh, and also depends on how the structure was built and supervised, which again also add the randomness of the strength. So I can also assume it has a probability distribution as such. It's going to also have some uh, mean value. Uh, now this is a nominal value, and the nominal value is something that we can compute based on strength. It's a little bit more uh, conservative. So if I want to choose a design value, I probably will choose a design strength which is less than both the nominal and average value. Okay, just to be uh, safe. Okay, so what I'm saying here, when I'm saying I'm choosing a strength value that is or a design value that, that is less than the actual strength, it does that mean that this it is, is its actual strength? It is a value that is less than provided. So here I'm giving myself some sort of a safety. The same thing that I did with uh, the design load. So my overall safety margin would be that difference uh, between the strength and uh, the load. So the higher the strength and the lower the load, the higher my safety uh, would be, and this is what I call the safety margin. Okay, uh, and this mean or the average mean again, the further it is from zero, the safer my structure is, the closer it is to zero, the less safe it will uh, become. Now, this coefficient here, the beta, usually is a multiple of. If you remember in uh, statistics, we also had for a normal distribution, we'd also assume that I have a three sigma, four sigma. So it will be the average plus three standard deviation, plus or minus, or four deviation, okay? So for me, I would like to keep the probability of failure to an order of one to 100,000. Then usually my beta should be in lie anywhere between three uh, and four, okay? Now, why do I need a safety margin? Now, again, Actual loads may be different from those assumed, and that happens. Uh, actual loads may be distributed again in a manner different from that it is uh, assumed. Uh, the assumption and simplification uh, inherent in any analysis may result in calculated load effects different from the actual load. If you remember when we started in the first series, we had like five assumptions and we said if those five assumptions are not met, then my design process uh, or the theory that I'm using to get the uh, dimension of the structure are not uh, going to be uh, accurate. Again, there are simplifications and assumptions, so which means I'm not quite sure or 100% sure which will also will lead me to have some sort of the need for having uh, a margin of safety. Uh, actual member dimensions may differ from those specified. Anybody who went on construction sites can attest that usually you tell them I want it uh, 50 by 60 he, centimeters, he usually does not get it, or there's also going to be some uh, errors there. Uh, reinforcement may not be prop in the proper position, uh, that's also true. Uh, actual strength may be different from that uh, specified. Again, it all depends on how you are controlling uh, the workers at a construction site. So if you're uh, precise and accurate, you might not get there. Sometimes the other things uh, might, might happen. So all these factors usually will lead to me needing the uh, margin of. Now, going a little bit further, so again, and let me just re-emphasize, the further the mean m from zero is, okay, the better it is for my structure. So I could have another approach in making a beta being three to four or achieving a probability of failure uh, in one to a hundred thousand. What if I took the average strength value or the mean strength value and then multiplied it by some factor which is less than one, okay? And then on the other side, I went to the mean load or average load and then multiplied that by another factor which is, I guess, bigger than one, right? So here I made the strength smaller and I have made the load a little more uh, bigger, okay? So in that way, I will assure that I have a bigger safety. So how would I translate this in practice? So it is more convenient to introduce the partial safety coefficient 
with respect to code specified loads. As you know, we have uh, uh, code uh, specified loads such as the ASC uh, 16, which uh, tells you how much, let's say, the life load for uh, occupants in the hospital should be. I think that's around 4.8 kilonewton, 4.2 kilonewton per meter square. Again, all these specified codes are based on studies and surveys. Uh, again, and these loads are actually more than the average loads, so it will have more safety. Uh, similarly, the partial safety coefficients are used with respect to the nominal strength values. Again, the nominal strength values are values based on the calculation that will give me what the calculated strength would be, and they are usually more conservative than the mean strength value. So I'm going to change my equation that I showed you in the preflow side and change the coefficient. I'm going to introduce what I call phi and multiply that by the nominal strength. And then gamma is going to be multiplied by my design load. So I'm going to call this now the ultimate load, hence the name ultimate strength method. And again, these factors are based on statistical information, experience, and engineering uh, judgment. And now I'm going to actually start off with the uh, ultimate load. Here, I'm going to take this uh, table, which is introduced in the uh, ACI uh, 19. And here I have what I call the load uh, com combination. Now, if you remember, we said u is equal to gamma times q design load. Now, if I look at the first one where you were saying it's equal to 1.4 times d, where d is the dead load, then here by the value of my gamma is 1.4. Okay. If I look at the second table, my ultimate load, let's say where I have a primary load as dead load, live load, or what we call the roof life load, snow, or rain load, then it will be 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live load plus one half, and now that would be my gamma coefficients. Okay. Now going down the table, now we have different combination. Again, here's a dead load, wind load, live load, roof, life load, snow load, and rain load. When I say primary load, I mean the load with the biggest value. Okay. So here's the dead load, here's the live load, here's the roof snow and rain load, uh, here's the wind load, uh, earthquake load, again wind load, and then here's the earthquake load. So you can see the different primary loads, I'm going to have different uh, coefficients. Uh, so let's to give you an example. So let's say my uh, I have a beam like this, and then I have a distributed load on it like that. And let's say that my distributed load, dead load, I'm going to call that WD, is equal to, let's say, 12 kilonewton per meter. And let's assume I have a live load, and that's equal to 20 kilonewton per meter. And let's also add a snow load of, let's say, 10 kilonewton. So if I want to calculate the ultimate load for these three type of loads that I have, so I would go to the table, let's say, and I would say that, okay, let me calculate based on the dead load. I mean, I know here the dead load will not have much of an influence, but so just humor me. So U1 now would be 1.4 times the dead load, which is 12, and that will give me a value of approximately, I guess, 17 kilonewton per meter. So that would be my U1. Now, I have, uh, let me calculate U2 somewhere else. So well, let's do it here. So U2 now would be my 1.2 times the dead load, which is what, 12, plus my live load of 1. 0.6 times my live load, which is 20, and that will be approximately, I guess, 46 kilonewton per meter. And then my third 
combination U3 would be now 1.2 again times my live load, my dead load, sorry, which is 12 plus 1.6 times my snow load, which is 10 plus my live load, which is again here, it's one times live load, which is 20. And that would be equal to, I guess, 50. Okay. So out of these three loads, 50 is the larger one. So in my design for this beam, my ultimate load, I would use the combination of U3. So I will not add U1 plus U2, U3. No, I would actually take the larger of these uh, three combinations. Okay. Uh, for us, uh, in this course, we are only going to be concerned probably just with the first two, the dead load and live load. Uh, maybe if there's a single dead load, then we can use the 1.4 uh, dead load. Okay. Moving on. Now, uh, there is uh, special provisions for uh, how to handle what we call the uh, fluid load, whether that's uh, gas, liquid, any liquid load, we call it a uh, fluid load. Okay. So, if I go back to this table, it has... Uh, the following provisions. Now, if F, which is my fluid load, acts alone or adds to the effect of the dead load, it shall be included with the factor of 1.4 in equation 5.31, which is like here. So he is telling me that in this case, treat my fluid load as a dead load, pure and simple. Now, if F, the second provision, adds to the primary load, it shall be included with a load factor of 1.2. Again, deal with it as a dead load. Okay, so in this case, probably U here would be 1.2 times the dead load plus the fluid load plus 1.6 life load. Again, let's add to the primary load. Right now, if the fluid load is permanent and counteracts the primary load, so if it's opposite to the primary load. I will be included the load factor of 0.9 in equation G, which is this one right here. Okay, so that will be now here plus 0.9F. If the effect is not permanent, but when present counteracts the primary load, F shall not be included in equation 53A and 5.3.1G. So if it counteracts, so if it's opposite to the dead load, equal to it, then I will not count it, and we'll just keep the dead load of 1.4 dead load. If it counteracts both the dead load plus the earthquake load, which is right there, then I will not count, count it either. Okay, so this is how I deal with the fluid load. Uh, talking about the lateral earth pressure, which is due to uh, mainly soil, okay? Then again, there are certain provisions, and here we only have three provisions. So if H acts alone or adds to the primary load effect, it shall be included with a load factor of 1.6. So here I'm dealing with the soil load bore off as a live load. So when it says acts alone, so it will replace equation 5.13, and this would be equal to 1.6H. Okay? Now, if it has uh, this combination with dead load, then it will be 1.2 dead load plus 1.6 live load plus 1.6 H. If the effect of H is permanent and counteracts the primary load effect, it shall be included with a load factor of 0.9. So this is a respective of the primary load. If that soil pressure or lateral earth pressure is opposite to that primary load and permanent, then I can use a factor of Nine. If the effect of H is not permanent, but when present it counteracts the primary load effect, then H shall not be included. So I really don't need to add the influence of the uh, lateral earth uh, pressure. And you're going to deal with lateral earth pressure when you take the uh, foundation course. Uh, moving on. Now, 
After finishing the factors of load factors, I'm going to talk about the uh, design strength or the factors that have influenced the strength. Again, I need to have my nominal strength be larger or equal to the uh, alternate load. Again, here I can allow the, side, the equal sign because, again, I'm making my strength, my actual strength value smaller and I'm making my actual load uh, larger. So here I can allow for the uh, equal sign. Usually when we design for nominal strength, we usually design structure to uh, uh, withstand the applied moment, the applied shear, and the applied axial force. Now for a moment, usually phi is in the range of, uh, well, it's 0.9. Uh, it can be lessened, but we will explain that as we move on. Uh, for shear, this value of phi is usually 0.75. For the axial force, uh, this ranges between 0.65 to 0.75, depending on what type of columns I usually have or what type of uh, reinf uh, lateral reinforcement that I have. And again, we will come to, for, to explain that in, uh, detail, in detail. So now after setting up uh, the values or the factors that we multiply our so now we're going to talk about what happens when we are uh, close to the ultimate load, okay? or let's say close to failure. As we said before, the stresses are no longer proportional to the strains. And as you can see from this uh, drawing uh, right here, what we are mainly interested in, we are mainly interested in finding out what my compressive force is going to be. And we would like to know where that uh, location of that compressive force is as well. And that will enable us to calculate the internal moment of my uh, cross section. So if you look at the distribution right here, then we can make the claim that my compressive force is some average value or is the average stress value on that cross section times the area of that cross section, which is B times C. Now, this is being my B, which is the width of the cross section, and C is the location to my neutral axis, which is right here. So, what I'm doing, I'm saying, well, my force is equal to stress times area. And it was found out through numerous uh, experimentation that my average stress is related to my uh, compressive strength, which is my F prime C through a factor which I'm going to call alpha, which is to me at this point is, is unknown. So I'm saying that my C, compressive force, is equal to this unknown value alpha times F prime C, which is the compressive strength, times the area, which is B times uh, C. Okay. So now this will give me my compressive force. If we pay attention to this figure right here, again, C is equal to alpha F prime C B times C, and then we know that C uh, the, the, is going to be at some uh, location uh, with going to be a multiple of this value C, which I'm going to call beta. Again, beta at this stage is unknown uh, to me. So now I know my compressive force. I know where the location of it is. Okay. I always know where my uh, steel reinforcement is, so there's no argument there. And then the force T is simply the area of steel times the stress uh, generated in those uh, reinforcement uh, bars. Again, D is the distance from the top extreme fiber to the location of the centroid of my reinforcement. So if I want to calculate the moment arm, then this is simply D, this distance here, minus beta C. So this is now what I call the distance Z, or the moment arm between the couple uh, the compression force and the, the tension force. Again, C is equal to T. Never forget that. All right. If I look at the strain distribution or the strain <clears throat> figure, again, this is my ultimate crushing strength of concrete. I'm going to call that C ultimate. C is, again, <clears throat> the distance to the neutral reactors. D is what we said before. Then I can find the uh, strain in the uh, steel, which is simply the stress in the steel divided by the modulus of elasticity of the steel, which again, it is known. So what to do with uh, alpha and uh, beta? Now, the way that they were found, we, there were some extensive direct uh, measurements and indirect evaluations of numerous beams. So these are 
we might say that these are mainly expert from the comes from the experiment. So alpha is equal to 0.72 if my f prime c is less than 28 megapascals. Alpha is equal to 0.72 minus f prime c minus 28 over 7 times 0.04 if f prime c is less than equal to 55 megapascal and larger than 28 megapascal. Alpha is equal to 0.56 when f prime c is larger than 55 megapascal, meaning that the range of alpha is between 0.56 and 0.72 which means it can be never larger it can never be larger than 0.72 and it can never be smaller than 0.56 and with the same uh, from the same experiments we found out beta to be 0.425 if f prime c is less than or equal to 28 and beta has the following equation which is equal to 0.425 minus f prime c minus 28 over 7 times 0.025 if f prime c is uh, between 28 megapascal and less than or equal to 55 megapascal actually I should remove okay and uh, beta is going to be equal to 0.325 if f prime c is larger than 55 megapascal again so the range of beta is between 0.325 and 0.425 so it can't be it's never going to be larger than 0.425 and it's never going to be smaller than 0.325 based on the beams that they were tested okay and this value still have proven its uh, consistency through throughout so by that i'm basically telling you now i know my alpha and i know my beta which means i will know exactly where my uh, the, what the value of my compressive force is, right? Because I will always know B and uh, I will know uh, C. In this case, I will know my compressive force and then the location is beta times uh, C. Okay, and I'll talk about how to find C in a, in, a, in a GP. Now, again, never forget that the compression is equal to the tension, which means that alpha F prime C B times C is equal to the area of steel times the stress in the steel, which means I can find the moment through multiplying the tension force by the distance z or multiplying the compression force by the distance z. So if I use tension, then this is going to be area of steel F, again, stress in the steel, times D minus beta C, which is this value right here. And from the moment I have alpha f prime c b c times d minus beta c. As you noticed, I put in f here, the, I put the stress in the steel. Uh, why that is? Because I have two values. The one value is which I always wanted to achieve is I want the stress in the steel to be yielding. As we mentioned before, one of my primary goals is to achieve the yield in steel so that I can get. Uh, some sort of uh, ductile uh, failure. So now dealing with the case when Fs is actually equal to Fy. Okay. So from that, by knowing now that Fs, which was an unknown to me, now it's known it's equal to Fy, I can find out what the value of C is. And I find that through the equation that the tension is equal to compression, right? Now this compression is equal to alpha f prime c b times c and now this would be simply f y times the area of steel okay so from that i can find c which is equal to a s area of steel times f y which is known divided by alpha which is also known divided by f prime c which is known and b which is also known now i'm going to remove the area of steel and then put instead rho b times d plus c will be rho times fy times d divided by alpha f prime c so now we have the value for c i can go uh, and calculate that through the moment of uh, tension force times the distance uh, z so i'm going to replace that with uh, area of steel times fy which is again is rho times b times d times Fy, and then I have to multiply that by um, D minus beta uh, C. As you can see, now I'm going to replace the C with rho Fyd divided by alpha F prime C, 
which will make d as a common denominator and then i'm going to take that out so i'm going to have rho times fy times b times d squared times one minus rho beta times rho times fy divided by alpha f prime c and you will notice that uh, the division of beta times alpha is constant uh, regardless of the range and that's going to be equal to 0.59 you will find in some books uh, 0.588 uh, but I think 95 to 96% use 0.59. I am one of those uh, people who use the value of 0.59. So from that, I was able to find the nominal moment that this cross section can handle, which is equal to rho times Fy times B times D squared times 1 minus 0.59 times rho times Fy divided by F prime C. Again, this is only valid for when I have yielding in steel. As I said, one of my primary goals is going to be to enforce or to ensure that I have yielding in the steel. So the question becomes what happens if I don't have yielding in steel and crushing in concrete happens first. So you will find that some older designs uh, still exist in which this case is actually uh, valid. So if you need to f figure out what the uh, moment for these cases are, then we have to approach this uh, differently. So what that means, it means that I actually don't know what my uh, stress in the steel is, again, because I had failure in the concrete before I had yielding in the steel. So which means that my stress, the value Fs, is going to be less than Fy. I know what Fy is, but I don't know what if it's less than Fy. So to me, this is practically an unknown. But what do I know? I know the following. I know that I can express my stress as the strain times the modulus, according to Hooke's law, because it's still the steel behaves linearly up till yielding. So I can make good use of that. Now I'm going to use the uh, similarity of uh, triangles. Okay. Um, you're going to use this uh, triangle in which I'm going to say that the ultimate strain of concrete divided by C is going to equal to the strain in the steel divided by D minus uh, C. Okay, so I'm using this triangle with that triangle. All right, so from that, I can find out what the stress in the steel would be. And that's going to be equal to the epsilon ultimate, which is the ultimate crushing strain, which is, again, it ranges between 0 0.003 and 0 0.004, but the code usually 0 0.003, and I'm going to use the same value. So I, would, I know what my ultimate strain is. So this value is known, okay? The modulus of elasticity is also known, which is about 2.1, uh, or let's say 210 gigapascals or 200 gigapascals, one of these values. Uh, D I will know, whether by design or by analysis, but then C is still an unknown to me, okay? So still, I still don't know what the value of C is. I still don't know what, where the location of my uh, neutral axis is. So the way to find out, I'm going to use uh, the equilibrium equation that my tension force is equal to my compression force. From that, I'm going to say that alpha F prime C B C is equal to the area of steel times the stress in the steel. So I'm going to leave that as is, alpha F prime C B times C. Now I'm going to replace the Fs with this. Okay. Now, alpha is known, F prime is known, B is known, C is unknown, known, known, known known, unknown, and unknown. So I have one equation with one unknown that is equal to C. So I'm going to just rearrange uh, the equation. And at the end, it becomes a quadratic equation, which I know how uh, to solve. Okay. I'm going to introduce this uh, uh, symbol delta, which is equal to area of steel times epsilon ultimate times es divided by alpha f prime cb and now this will simplify the equation to c squared plus lambda c minus lambda d and that is going to be equal to zero 
and from that I can find the value of C which is equal to again you're going to get the positive and the negative value obviously I'm interested in the positive value so now this is going to be my C which is equal to one half times minus uh, lambda plus the square root of lambda times 4d plus uh, lambda okay uh, as you can see this is completely known and this is known so I can find the value of C. Once I find the value of C, I can find the value of Fs. Once I find the value of Fs, I can find uh, the tension force inside uh, the uh, reinforcement. C equal to T. Then from that, I can find the compressive force. From the compressive force, obviously, also I can find the compressive force. And from that, I can calculate the uh, moment at failure. So the key here is you have to know whether you have yielding in the steel or uh, you don't if i have then it's going to be simply fy if not then i have to go and figure it out okay so that's how we deal with the uh, cal calculation of both compressive force tension force and the nominal uh, moment okay before i solve an example there's something else i would like to introduce as i said we mentioned something earlier that we want our design to uh, have a ductile failure instead of a uh, brittle failure. And we also mentioned to you at the beginning that I'm going to only find that out through the reinforcement ratio uh, rule. And this is how we're going to do it. So now let me introduce to you what I call the balanced reinforcement ratio and what that means. Or oh, let's read it. It is the ratio necessary for the beam to fail by crushing of the concrete at the same load that causes the steel to yield okay and i'm going to call that raw balance right so that raw balance means i have crushing and yielding at the same time okay obviously if i want pure ductile failure i want to be below that ratio but again i need to know what that ratio is i need to know when i'm going to have crushing and yielding at the same okay so i'm going to use the same technique that i used before first of all i'm going to say that my fs okay is equal to epsilon ultimate times es d minus c over uh, c correct but again we said that now this is going to be yielding right so i'm going to replace the fs with fy all right so now fy is going to be equal to the ultimate strain Fy over epsilon y, here I'm replacing ES, times D minus C over C. From that, I can figure out what the value of C is. Okay, so this is the C in which I'm having crushing and yielding at the same time. And by crushing, I mean crushing of concrete at the value of 0 0.003 and yielding of the steel, okay, which is simply the Fy, which is, in, let's say in our case, 420, divide that by 2.1, it will give you a yield strain of equal to 0 0.002, all right? So once I have figured out what the C is, again, I'm going to use the compression is equal to tension. Now, the compression is alpha F prime C BC, which is equal to area of steel. Now I'm going to replace the area of steel with rho BD times the st the yielding or fs which is now fy okay from that i can figure out what that ratio of rho is and i'm going to call that rho balance so now rho balance is going to be equal to alpha f prime c divided by fy times epsilon ultimate divided by epsilon yield plus epsilon ultimate so this value right here this ratio is telling me that you are if you achieve this you are going to have crushing of concrete, yielding of steel at the same time, okay? Now, this is known, this is also known, this is known, this is known, which again, just to remind you, it's going to be 0 0.003, and the yield strain for steel is going to be 0 0.002, okay? So for grade 60 or for FY 420, we can always use the epsilon yield or the yield strain to be 0 0.002. And that's the reason why we introduced rho at the beginning. So just to reemphasize, rho balance is the reinforcement ratio that will have crushing of concrete 
and yielding of steel at the same time okay and that's what we call wool bands all right let's have an example so here i want you to find the nominal moment mn at which the beam will fail okay i'm going to use the same example that we used before in uh, the previous uh, recording uh, again just as a, as a reminder f prime c is 28 megapascal fy is 420 megapascal this amount to almost 280 kilograms per centimeter square or 4200 kilogram per centimeter square now d is 600 millimeters b 250 h is equal to 0 .6, uh, 650 and then i have 3 phi 25 okay now as we said we need to figure out if my steel has yielded or not right because if it is yielded then i can use the nominal moment that we found out if not then i have to calculate fs and then from this calculated fs i have to actually calculate my uh, my nominal moment so for me to do that, I have first to calculate the RA, which is area of steel divided by BD, which in my case for 3 phi 25 is equal to 1472 millimeter square, divided by B, which is 250 times 600, and this is equal to 9.817 times 10 to the minus 3. So this is now my actual RA, or the RA of the cross section. Now I have to compare that RA with RA balance. Again, Raw balance is the ratio that it will tell me that I have crushing and yielding at the same time. Okay, so by doing that, F prime C, as I know, is 28, so this will give me an alpha of 0.72. Divide that by my yield, which is 420. Again, this is my epsilon ultimate for crushing, and this is my epsilon Y for steel, and the value of that is 0 0.0288. Now, because my raw is less than raw balance, it will fail due to yielding of steel. Okay, so the deciding factor of yielding of steel for single reinforced concrete is raw balance. So if my raw is less than raw balance, steel has yielded, concrete has not crushed yet. If my raw is equal to raw balance, I have both crushing and yielding. If my raw is larger than raw balance, then I have crushing, but I don't have yielding, and that will imply that I need to calculate Fs. Okay, but again, since my raw now is less than raw B, then my nominal moment is going to be raw times Fy times BD squared times 1 minus 0.59 raw Fy over F prime C. Now, this is the raw that I calculated. This is Fy, this is B, this is my D squared, the constant 0.59. This is equal to raw, Fy, and then this is my F prime C. So this is telling me that the nominal moment that this section can handle is 338.84 kilo newton meter. So if it reaches that value, that value I'm going to have still. Okay. Now I need to calculate C, which is the location of the neutral axis, and that's going to be simply raw times Fy Fb over alpha F prime uh, C. And that's giving me a value of 122.71 uh, millimeters. So that's the location of the uh, neutral axis. Okay. Uh, you guys have a nice day. I hope uh, everything is fine and uh, stay safe.